Space Talks with Z is hosted by America's Future Series great friend and advisor, Zahir Ali. Space Talks with Z provides a forum for thought leaders to share insights and recommendations on how America and its allies can stay at the forefront of exploration, commercialization, and defense of space. Please visit our website to register to see all of Z's content and our many other programs for free at www.americas-fs.org. We especially hope you will join Jeff Bezos, National Cyber Director Chris Inglis, Orson Scott Card, General Keith Alexander, and many other interesting leaders during our virtual Cyber, Land, Air, Sea, and Space Summit on November 1st and 2nd. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Space Talks with Z. I've got here a world-leading expert on uh, space, space technology, uh, defense, and in particular, uh, a lot of current events that are happening. We are seeing um, the future unfold before our very eyes. Uh, so we're, we'd like to welcome uh, Peter Gerritsen, um, formerly of the U.S. military, served for uh, uh, several decades. Um, is now uh, a senior fellow at the American Foreign Policy Institute, where he is an independent scholar and consultant, uh, and uh, spends his uh, time thinking about what uh, is happening in the world, what is happening out of this world uh, with technology, um, uh, the great power conflict, and um, what is the right path to weave, uh, frankly, for the free world. Um, you know, and at America's Future Series, we'd love to thank our sponsors, particularly Contech. We've got the uh, class summit coming up where uh, we're going to see uh, a great variety of uh, senior leaders from uh, the U.S. and some from uh, around the world uh, who are also going to contribute to this conversation. But first of all, Peter, thank you very much for joining us. Um, welcome, sir. And, you know, I really look forward to, to this conversation. Um, I'd love, uh, before we really get started, I'd love for you to, in your own words, tell us a little bit about your background and, and in particular, where your mind is these days uh, in, in both your scholarship and your, your uh, consulting. Sure. So uh, I became interested in space when I was at headquarters Air Force, um, having come to it from a, from a different career field and uh, rapidly became convinced that this is really where the major strategic opportunities for the United States lay and sort of continued in that vein, uh, had the opportunity to research where sort of the gray zone competition was going with Dr. Damrata Goswami and we co-published a book called Scramble for the Skies. And I remain, thank you so much, and I remain, um, you know, principally interested at the nexus of commercial space and industrial space and where uh, the sort of the way you phrased it, you know, where the free peoples of the world need to put their efforts in order to assure the best possible future for humanity in space. And I should say on, on Earth. On Earth, right. I mean, the, and then that's really what this is, is it's space for, for humanity. Um, this book, Scramble for the Skies, uh, we actually teach it in my program at Thunderbird School for Global Management, uh, Space Leadership, Business and Policy. Um, it's really probably the most important um, book so far of its generation um, on this topic, which is the great power conflict um, to control uh, space. And it's it's amazing that we can say that sentence. I don't know that when I was a boy watching Star Trek um, and playing around with M80s and doing all types of goofy things um, that thankfully I survived, um, that I, I really believed we would be having that conversation. It was always there, but, but now we're, we're at it. And, and not only are we at that point, but we also see a confluence of government and industry technologies, assets being used in collaboration, uh, commercial assets being used for defense purposes, even, com even defense assets you know, as they age, being put into commercial use. It, it's it's a really a, bla a brave new world. Um, and it goes beyond just the lowering of the cost of launch, but to all the consequences thereof. Um, can you help us kind of frame this, what's happening here between the dual use tech, the commercial and the, and the defense use cases and what's going on? We hear a lot about it in the news, you know, Ukraine, Starlink, et cetera. For, for our audience, can you kind of help us put a box around the issue a little bit? Sure. So. You know, when when we first started to explore space, it was entirely sort of a statist approach. 
you know, it was the superpowers that were the only ones that had the technology and funding to get into space. But over time, that has proliferated to the private sector who took that initial government investment and found ways to make it uh, cheaper and, and proliferated broadly and to go after much, much larger markets than just say intelligence or defense. And because we've seen this uh, explosion um, in part due to um, concerted policy efforts by the space advocacy community that pushed very hard for policies that would enable commercial which you know ultimately you know led into, for instance, NASA COTS, and then of course the well-executed programs um, of the government like NASA COTS to sort of give birth and return launch and, and cheaper launch, uh, you know that they wisely postured as something that um, wasn't just for them but was intentionally supposed to create a broader industry that has led to an explosion of potential space services um, and as well as a confidence on the part of both the, the space industry and the American public, really global public, uh, that this was an area worthy of investment. So, you know, once we started to see a little bit of commercial success, it's been cumulative where more and more investment comes in giving birth to more and more companies in a broader and broader ecosystem, certainly enabled by much more available uh, launch, not just cheaper launch, but also, uh, you know, launch that is more responsive in time that enable different business cases. And so we've seen an explosion, you know, first in communication, then we saw an explosion in remote sensing uh, of various different phenomenologies. And now we're seeing internet and then I suspect, you know, it won't be that long before we start seeing some impressive in space industrial capabilities, um, including the manufacture of solar power satellites that I think will be, you know, the, the next truly world changing market. So that's that's a wide variety of technologies. Um, some of them are, are coming like the like the in space manufacturing and assembly. A service assembly and manufacture, I should say, and that and that workshop is actually going. I think it just finished. Um, it, it was at Goddard, uh, the NASA ISAM workshop. Um, lots of interesting uh, discussion there. Things have moved forward a, a lot. Um, Orbit Fab, for example, in terms of in space service, has a uh, a real contract from from the DoD to to provide uh, fuel on orbit. Um, so gas stations in space. Um, I remember when. I first heard about what Dan was doing years ago, um, and people, a lot of people, poo pooed it. Said, "Oh, that's ridiculous. That doesn't make any sense." It turns out it made a heck of a lot of sense to the right customer, and now um, it's it's going to be implemented. Um, and then a lot of the technology has been demonstrated. But but even as that's happening, what dominates the new cycle right now is really the the clear and super sharp use cases of uh, Starlink. Um, uh, and and actually other uh, other companies, I believe, uh, Comtech and Biosat as well, are are providing um, systems to support um, uh, the effort in Ukraine um, to to fend off the Russian invasion. And what's also happened simultaneous to that is there's now this discussion about, hey, you've got a CEO who thinks foreign policy should be run a certain way, and is now. Try pushing buttons on the, the technology capability he provided to the defense community to to try to pressure them to execute the foreign policy he thinks is right. This is possibly unprecedented since the maybe maybe Gatling did this when they invented the, 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 the you know the, the the Gatling gun perhaps I, I can't I don't know that I can think of another um, tech. Uh, uh, another, uh, you know, people could say maybe Hearst did this with the Spanish-American War that some people say the, you know, the the Hearst family started. But 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 this is in in at least in the last hundred, you know, fifty to seventy-five years, this is unprecedented. Um, yeah, how, I don't it's think it's evolving. It's it's a very in, it's strange. It's interesting, um, concerning perhaps. Well, I mean, I I, uh, I share your curiosity about how it will evolve. I think what we're seeing are many different precedents being set 
uh, and, and how those will evolve when other actors uh, have similar capabilities or similar empowered individuals um, is very interesting. You know, it, uh, you know, we don't know what we don't know, but, you know, it certainly, you know, didn't look as if there was a, uh, a public request, you know, by the government for Starlink, you know, for SpaceX to get involved. And certainly Elon's tweets would suggest that he's sort of footing the bill and, and going it alone, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But, you know, what we're seeing is a super empowered individual um, who controls a global communication system unlike the world has ever seen, being able to weigh in, uh, in this case, at least, you know, principally on the side, you know, of of global norms of like, you don't invade your neighbor. Um, you know, we respect the sovereignty of, uh, of countries to sort of, you know, maintain their own borders at least. And, uh, you know, it's been amazingly effective. Um, you know, and as far as like where it goes, obviously because it's effective, you know, we have seen, you know, uh, reports of attacks by you know russia on starlink you know attempted attacks through cyber and electronic warfare and bluster about the possibility of you know using a kinetic asap um but it's also you know fascinating because the the viability of a system that's that large and you know the impossibility of the of the ugly cost exchange ratio i mean you know, uh, SpaceX can crank out satellites, you know, much faster and much cheaper than Russia could crank out anti-satellite missiles. And so, you know, it, it has proven, you know, the utility, uh, at least against a kinetic threat uh, of what you know, people call a proliferated low Earth constellation. Now, you know, it is worth asking, you know, could could the rules change? You know, could they decide to to you know, blow it up, well, they could, they'd be incurring a lot of costs, you know, by attempting to, you know, to do that even against, you know, one satellite. Um, and I suspect that it is an unwillingness to bear those international costs, those audience costs as to why that, why that hasn't happened. Um, but it's of course made the Chinese sit up and say, well, how would we, you know, actually have a paper about, you know, how would they deny Starship or, yeah, uh, sorry, Starlink. Um, you know, if they were in a in such a conflict, and you know, we have to also wonder, you know, what about turnabout? You know, what happens when another nation has this type of capability and uses it in a manner, you know, that is uh, against our foreign policy interests, or, or an indiv a super empowered individual? And as you mentioned, you know, here we have. You know, the last time I checked, the richest man in the world, you know, with his own global uh, communication system um, and uh, and with a, a unique uh, voice and influence on Twitter, you know, sort of able to pull pull on the foreign policy strings. Um, and that is sort of interesting and unprecedented. Now, whether or not that exactly would be replicated, you know, in a in another, you know, country, authoritarian regimes are likely to be able to keep a tighter leash on their, mm, just look uh, at Jack on their citizens. Yeah, um, but you can't rule out, you know, that uh, you know that a super empowered individual in a friendly nation with such capabilities, you know, could have a specific foreign policy bent. Um, so this certainly raises, you know, a lot of interesting questions. You know, it's not an entirely clear you know, where they will go, um, but, uh, you know, but they are things that are, are being talked about, I think, in all the halls of power right now. Thinking about this, there's also kind of some, some adjacencies, right? Um, because when you, right, there's, there's the, as you mentioned, what happens when you have multiple individual, multiple such networks? Um, could be leveraged by 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 both us and and by by an adversary. Um, there's al also the concept, the, but one of the key questions 
uh, again, comes back to uh, in terms of the great power conflict and particularly in terms of positioning, what about, you know, what about other technologies that could be uh, of, of such relevance, um, whether they are um, different types of platforms in space um, or they are platforms beyond uh, orbit, um, either either in 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 cis lunar space as uh, as depots, etc., or or possibly even going to going to uh, the moon for lunar resource capture. Um, we know that the craters there are uh, are are created primarily by asteroid impact, and therefore we expect that there are significant deposits of what we currently call rare earths. Uh, rare earth metals. At this point, we should probably just start calling them rare metals, um, since we're looking beyond Earth. <laughs> I don't know. We're going to call them rare moon metals, rare lunar metals, whatever. But um, you know, and and so you you have things like the Lunar Prospector mission that's going to do some analysis of this. Uh, you can see possibly a conflict ar arising around access and rights to those to those resources, where where nation states would want to try to protect their the, the countries under their flag or under allies' flags, um, and and you could end up in a much more direct um, discussion here uh, about who who gets to say what, um, and in the middle of it will continue to be the private sector, um, which which is a little different. And and we know from history that these things haven't always ended well. When 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 two nations were protecting their their oil companies' rights, or even going farther back to things like the East India Company, etc. You know, trade. You know, protectivity of trade and 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 wealth uh, creation is is historically a function of government. So, thinking about that, and in light of, of course, you, you know, your research, I'd be curious to hear your you know, your thoughts on on how how that part might evolve to adjacent technologies um, in in the near future, um, possibly the far future. But I think what's really interesting is, is possibly what's going to happen kind of in the Artemis timeline, you know, the next, you know, three to th three to 10 years. Yeah. So, I mean, you've hit on a lot of interesting subjects there and subjects that are near and dear to, to my heart. And, you know, I, I should mention that in the very last chapter, uh, of our book, we spend a lot of time looking at a, at a variety of scenarios of exactly, you know, how, how in cislunar and on the moon could you expect that, you know, conflict might come about over what, in what manner, what are the analogies to things that have happened uh, on Earth before? And, and I think you're absolutely right that when you look at societies, you know, societies are driven, you know, by a need to sustain what they have and to Im improve their absolute position as well as their relative position. And so, you know, right now, things that matter a lot to that are, of course, you know, uh, comparative industrial bases, you know, the ability to, to make new and compelling uh, products, the inputs for those products in terms of strategic minerals, the access to the energy to transform those products, and of course, the uh, a transportation system that enables you to, to move that around. And this is where space just offers, you know, uh, like a billion times the potential resources of en energy and, and I don't mean all of space, I mean just our, our local inner solar system, you know, provides so many, and just to put that in perspective, right? I mean, it's like when the European powers discovered uh, the North American continent, you know, that was not, not quite twice the land area. Um, and yet, you know, you look at, you know, what it has become in terms of GDP, you know, for the world uh, as, as a fraction of GDP and how important it was to European politicking to try to establish positions in the new world. Well, I mean, that discovery looks like peanuts compared you know, to the size of resources that are out in space. And, you know, because countries uh, are looking to be able to support their growth in energy and resources because they want to uh, extend their, their competitive position and because they want to, you know, pursue relative gains compared to their competitors, 
you know, they're going to be sensitive to anything that provides them with an advantage and space potentially provides this enormous advantage. And so you can certainly imagine that in the near term, as you start to uh, explore the first most valuable places, those places are to some extent, uh, you know, as vast as the resources are in general. The first best places when you're putting a tenuous hold are not that many, and you can see, for instance, right. that the United States and China are eyeing sort of the same places on the lunar south pole as being attractive because of their access to both sunlight and the cold traps where the water is. And you could imagine, you know, that both countries might sponsor uh, their own commercial entities. And commercial entities are also pursuing their own advantage. And so, you know, you could see them sort of come into conflict. And, you know, this drives a lot of people to sort of say, oh, you know, this type of competition is bad. It could, like you say, it, could, it might end in a bad way. And therefore, you know, the solution is, you know, that we need to hold hands and all do it together. And I think that's unlikely to work for a variety of reasons. You know, one reason is just that all you do is to sublimate the competition, you know, mm. you know, that it, it just becomes under the surface, but everyone's still fundamentally elbowing. Right. Um, you know, people call out uh, um, Antarctica as a model, but, you know, if you actually look at China's behavior in Antarctica, there's there's a lot to be concerned about in how they are positioning themselves for, um, you know, gobbling up the resources um, if and when the regime changes. And, you know, another thing I think is that uh, it it's not necessarily the best way forward for humanity because um, it, we can see that uh, when you remove the competitive element people just move slower. It's very hard to work with folks that don't have the same values as you do. So if you're concerned about, you know, for instance, tapping that, that billion fold greater energy in space to solve climate change, uh, you're going to get a lot faster if there's a, a competitive atmosphere. And then you also have to worry about atrophy on, on your side and the compromise of sort of, you know, moral position. So you know, you might think that a bit of conflict would be bad, you know, but is it worse than sort of allowing the the future of all humanity to be shaped by autocratic powers? You know, is that a better long term future for humanity to be, you know, uh, sort of under the foot, you know, of a, of a state that thinks that, you know, the citizens exist to support the state? So, you know, for a variety of reasons, I think that actually, you know, the the, the best case scenario, uh, you know, for the enlightenment derived states is really to be to get serious about competing and, and winning the competition, not for some type of, you know, power or aggrandizement, but just because being in the strongest position puts you in the strongest position to protect human rights, to protect you know, private industry to protect, you know, private property. Um, you you just want to be in a position to extend, you know, the certainly the parts that we have found valuable in our own constitution and other countries have found valuable in incorporating into their constitution to include the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Man. Um, you, you need to be out there shaping the domain such that you know you are you are enriching um the societies that that respect the individual as opposed to seeding or empowering or and providing wealth to uh, powers that have a very different vision of the role of the individual you know that's that's really that you covered a lot there um it reminds me of a conversation i had um a few years ago now um i was in in I was in Beijing, um, and uh, I actually had occasion through through Thunderbird to to have a chat with with a relatively high ranking party member. This is somebody who who wasn't active anymore was was kind of semi retired, 
or an advisor to people, a bit of a bit of a, you know, maybe not quite a kingmaker, but maybe a duke maker, as it were. Um, and, you know, I, I asked him pretty directly, I said, look, you know, the US and China seem to be headed for 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 at some point, you know, some sort of direct, um, direct disagreement. And it was interesting because he said, you know, it, it, it's not going to be pleasant, but at the end of the day, it may be it may be the fever that that the world needs. Um, you know, uh, now now that's a little scary to think about. Uh, I think, um, you know, as 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 a citizen with kids and, and a house and a mortgage, uh, <laughs> um, because you know that that's probably going to be uncomfortable times. But but what if that? But given the the various characters of the states now, our character. Uh, certainly their character, um, even if it's direct, it won't necessarily be kinetic. Um, it might not necessarily, you know, uh, as, as you alluded to earlier, you know, the attacks, um, we know there have been attacks on Starlink, but they haven't been kinetic yet. They've been cyber or or um, or uh, electronic of a different type. Um, but at some point, at some point, somebody's going to say, and maybe it's not one of the great powers, maybe it's, maybe, maybe, maybe it's a semi-rogue state like Iran, um, and and you could imagine if 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 Starlink was provided to to the citizens there today, uh, as they're in the, basically in the middle of of of, a, of an attempt at, at a revolution, that uh, that state may may want to try to take out whatever is providing that capability. Um, so as you know, commercial commercial CEOs now have have, have asked me, have said to me, here we don't know what's going to happen. So I, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts about. What, you know, do we need to consider as a country what a proportional response would be to to an attack on a commercial asset that the, that was being used in a defense or in, 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 in a national security fashion as one of many customers? Um, it's not clear. It, it, this is a little different than bombing factories that make tanks or or aircraft. Um, mm -hmm. This is th th this is now kind of like saying, look, you know. We're going to take down. We're going to take down AWS because because the government, your government, uses it as, as well as you know your ice cream vendor. Um, how, how do you? I'm curious as to your thoughts about what that would mean and what what we might maybe should do or or at least be thinking about in terms of doctrine, you know, for such eventualities. So you know, absolutely, we should be thinking about it. Um, we might internally have. You know, it'd be smart to draft a number of, of options and be smart to play through a number of tabletop exercises. But I probably differ with a lot of people in that I really do not favor, I don't think it benefits the United States to have a declaratory policy. Um, uh, you know, and there may be, you know, specific service agreements between, you know, uh, government users. There may be, you know, you know, not public, uh, you know, indemnity clauses and in particular contracts that, you know, might make sense. But I actually think that uh, there, are, let me give you some reasons why, you know, some people think, oh, I will be safer, you know, if I have a declaratory policy. Well, I don't think so. You know, when we have tried to have such a declaratory policy, um, adversarial powers are really adept about walking right up to the tiniest line where we're right on the edge of like, hey, you know, uh, do we really want to do this? Because the costs, you know, to us, the escalation is, is high. So if you put forward a declarative policy and then you decide, yeah, I don't really want to do that, mm. it makes it, you know, it makes you look really bad. It, it undermines, you know, what your right. word is for. Um, or it ties your hands where maybe it isn't the, the smartest thing to do. But I'm also not clear that it makes you safe either, because right now something like Starlink does enjoy the ambiguity as to whether or not it is, you know, a, a protected United States system. Um, and because of that, in the eyes of the world, um, it, it, and maybe not in the eyes of our adversary at the time, but in the eyes of the world, it's not entirely clear that this is synonymous with the United States. And it's not entirely clear that this is a captured bespoke service 
of the United States. And therefore, you know, uh, because it's not directly associated, you know, through some type of policy declaration, that may actually be protective, you know, because it could be that the, the rest of the audience that our adversaries are playing to, um, you know, uh, would think that would be in bad form to it to attack something that provides global services. Whereas if we were to, you know, make a a clear statement that says, nope, you know, we would view this as, you know, blankety blank, uh, you know, we we may invite um, that global audience to see Starlink, you know, as directly as a, associated. As a state asset. Right. And that that might push it closer to everybody sort of agreeing that this might be legitimate for them to go after. So I think that, you know, those are those are a couple of reasons why I don't think that it's necessarily helpful. But there's another reason, and that is that we should be anticipating that turnabout is fair play. And for instance, you know, we don't like and we would like to complain about the fact that they are you know, taking these cyber and EW actions against us. But but what happens when somebody is using a similar capability against us? You know, do we want to be in a position of looking hypocritical if we're going to do the same thing? Or, right. or let, let, let's say that it was the opposite, that it was a, you know, a Russian compa uh, uh, company that was enabling the precision bombing or targeting, you know, of the Ukrainian regime. Do we want to put ourselves in a position where, you know, we've made a declaratory policy that, you know, uh, interfering with or even striking a commercial uh, asset is off limits if it really matters? Um, you know, I don't know that we would want to take that off the table. So in many ways, I sort of think that this, this becomes more like, you know, espionage, espionage games where uh, or low intensity conflict where right, everybody right. knows that there are sort of games and rules. Nobody really wants to escalate, you know, but you just sort of are, are willing to play in this. And, you know, does that, you know, put some commercial uh, folks in an uncertain position? Um, I can see that it would, but frankly, I, I'm not sure that it's a better world um, you know, the other way around that, you know, if we were to suddenly, you know, declare certain systems as being, you know, uh, you know, critical systems for, you know, United States defense purposes, that could have, you know, uh, that could have the effect of calling attention to them of, you know, perhaps causing them to lose global customers uh, that I don't think is is necessarily in their or in the United States interest. So I, I favor, you know, a, a bit of ambiguity here. And, and if there are lessons that we want to teach, um, you know, I would think we should teach them through actions and not words. Hmm. You know, I would, I would favor just, you know, if they're going to mess with one of our constellations, I think we should mess with one of their constellations in, in an equivalent manner. Um, you know, so that it's clearly linked. This is one of the other, you know, uh, questions that often comes up in deterrence theory. And, you know, many people who are uh, concerned about, uh, well, many people who, who have an arms race, uh, who are concerned about arms races, you know, their, their logic is arms races create a, a spiral of distrust that spiral of distrust leads to lots of wasted resources to have such systems and uh, and an increased possibility of using them. Uh, and that, that, and so that, that may be a little aggressive in, in terms of uh, as a theory. To, to uh, say, well, you know. I, I don't actually, I mean, this logic certainly exists. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I, I, mean, I, I understand. It, it, it's not, not just in theory, it, it exists in the world. Right. Yeah. Um, but you know, the counter is that to fail to engage in an arms race, uh, if the other person takes an action, just puts you in a position of vulnerability. Right. Um, and in many cases, 
you know, we can see that arms races don't terminate in conflict. You know, we, we ran a very successful, you know, arms race with the Soviet Union yep. that, you know, ended up working out very, very well for us. So, you know, sometimes just the, the willingness to stand toe to toe matters. And in, and in the game of standing toe to toe of just demonstrating resolve that we're not going to surrender, you know, whatever this is, uh, you know, what comes up in that is that you really need to have in kind systems. So folks of the arms control community will often say we don't need to have capabilities, counter space capabilities in space, even if the other guy has them, because we can attack in the time and place of our choosing in another domain. But that's, in my view, a very dangerous situation to yeah, put yourself yeah, in you're, because you're widening the conflict. You're right? widening the conflict exactly, but it is moving a conflict to another domain where you may you don't know yeah, necessarily what's going It's happen. called horizontal escalation, right? right? right. So you know the, the clearest signal of displeasure is tit for tat. You know, it, it's a very limited. You did this to me. I'm going to do this back to you. And if you don't have the tools to do that. You know, then you put yourself in a in a in a position where you don't have the obvious tit for tat strategy to to the countermeasure to make the other party back off or back down or see that you have resolve. Now, in that regard, another scenario, and I know, and my instinct is you've thought of this as well, but I think is is interesting from the more economic and trade perspective, is take somebody like um, like Elon Musk with Starlink. Now, SpaceX is a company that's separate from Tesla, but Elon's fortune and ability to run both companies are, are very much intertwined. And there's a Tesla factory in China and they want to sell there. So, so say, say, that, say, you know, not, not next month, hopefully, but perhaps eventually um, next year, five years from now, whatever, we're facing a similar discussion about Taiwan. And, and those assets are, are made available, uh, you know, or, or, um, in Taiwan, um, as as we are supporting the island, trying to defend itself from from uh, for, from annexation um, by by main by the uh, communist China. And they say, well, look, if you don't turn off your Starlink, we're going to basically just take your factory, right? What, what whereas with a bespoke defense asset, of course, that's an impossibility. There's no there's no pressure that a foreign government could lever. Um, now, I'm I'm curious as to your thoughts about that. Now, that is a, perhaps a little bit of a unique case because this is is a is an individual with multiple high tech companies, etc. But given global supply chains, um, given how interwoven so much of economics is um, internationally. Um, even co companies that we think of as well, they're they're just American or they're just French or just British, and that's where their people are, and that's where they make stuff, and then they launch stuff out of uh, out out of um, um, uh, a democratic country's spaceport. But but there's there's back end reach back and levers that that autocratic directed economy governments can 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 push on. So I'm curious as to how, what your thoughts on on that would be, and kind of how you think the market would react, perhaps certainly how our government might react, um, and what might make sense. Well, this is an excellent line of questioning, and and it is something I've thought about. I mean, the you know, let me just first of all make make two points, harkening back to the earlier question. Yes. So you had mentioned that it doesn't necessarily the strategic competition, great power competition, doesn't necessarily have to go kinetic. And I think, you know, the majority of it will not be. I actually right. don't expect that the United States and China will, will get into a, a, a space war. I think it will be a, a, a muscling, a struggle for relative position um, and, uh, and uh, you know, partners in, in the game will be the primary game. Uh, I think that because um, outright warfare is likely to be increasingly more costly to both sides, but particularly in space. I think there are a lot of reasons to think that that, that will be self-moderating. And I think it will be additionally moderating by the middle powers. We devote a lot of, of discussion in our book to you know, how much influence the middle powers really have over two powers that are, that are both playing for influence among them. 
Um, you know, a second thing is that, you know, it, it isn't just autocratic powers that use the, the economic power they amass to bully their foreign policies, right? The United States has a, you know, going way back to- Yeah, of course, know, we do it all the what time. What we did with, you know, uh, you know, France and Great Britain over, over the Suez Canal, you know, right. and, and, you know, there's, there's a tremendous amount of power that comes from from amassing wealth and industrial depth and that's why i have always thought that the that the talking points of the space force itself are sort of misguided you know that they are misfocused on these tactical threats of anti-satellite web and of course you heard me just talk about the need why we need to have in kind yeah, of capability. Yeah. So you're not saying it's not uh, important. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just that that's not the important thing, right? I mean, it, right. it's that's like not the goal. That's not the outcome we're looking for. Right. I mean, the the fundamental thing for national security strategists is to put us in a dominant economic position so that we've got the larger war chest, the larger tax base, the larger industrial uh, strength that could be mobilized if it needed to be the larger, you know, logistics chain, and all those are enabled principally by the, the the private sector, and so the space force has to be in a position not just to use what the private sector is bringing, but to give them confidence and actively use its dollars to create scalable markets that are going to ensure that the United States is in the position to turn the keys on uh you know on economic coercion but you certainly you know and this of course it's a great example uh, you know that your your elon tesla uh you know starlink taiwan scenario is a terrific pressure point you know uh that's a specific to space but it is across the board and you say well maybe a national security asset probably not but you have to think about how deeply and cleverly the Chinese have insinuated themselves into investments and all kinds of boards, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, corporate boards across America in terms of, you know, policy funding for think tanks, as well as, you know, doing the same thing with our with our allies. So, you know, this is one of the reasons why many people are now talking about a more conscious disengagement uh, and, you know, a, a, uh, a more tit for tat type of strategy with China, because we see that, you know, we're being taken advantage of in terms of how they are, uh, you know, how they are abusing our, our openness, our open market while keeping theirs comparatively closed and controlled. But, you know, this problem that you suggested, you know, is faced by so many companies that, you know, are, you know, have assets in China or are, um, you know, feel themselves dependent upon the, the Chinese market. And that that is going to be a much bigger foreign policy problem to get over. But, you know, what we certainly don't want to do is to make it worse by closing off our sources or encouraging, you know, you know, losing entire market spaces to China. And, you know, for example, you know, we already are have a tremendous dependency on strategic minerals to China today. Right. You know, why would you, you know, put yourself in a position where you don't have preferential access to such resources, you know, on the moon or you know in in the asteroid belt um you've seen how aggressively china went after uh 5g and building it into their one belt one road right you know do you really want to you know just surrender and let them run ahead of you on space solar power um you know you see how aggressively they're working you know uh to sell their you know their state champion companies you know as part of their belt and road initiative you know do you really not want to have an, an answer for this in terms of the, the ground-based space race. Um, th there's a number of ways in which, you know, I think we, we need to make space a much more central part of our foreign policy. I, I, you know, I, as much as I liked a lot of the words in the new national security strategy, it was hard to miss that space was just two paragraphs and and you know, not 
not particularly bold. I mean, literally, space as its, as its own section was dead last in the entire report. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so seeing that the administration basically prioritizes space after the Arctic, after Africa, you know, you know, as sort of an afterthought, um, you know, continues to concern me that in this the vastest canvas, you know, on which you know great power competition, you know, in the future of human freedom will be written, uh, you know, that it is um, not appropriately emphasized. So you know we're we're coming up on on time here. Thank you so much for joining us. Your your insights have been uh, somewhat remarkable. You know you've said a, a variety of things here, but let let's um, you know I'd like to ask you kind of um, a, a, a question to to help us wrap this discussion up um, because we've touched on everything from kind of dual use commercial um, and military all the way to um, what it means uh, in terms of response. Um, to different scenarios uh, of, it, of, of, um, of well, I, I guess we could call them perhaps as a general class adversarial actions. I mean, it's not necessarily an, at an attack, right? It could be a variety of things, but it's actions our adversaries are taking um, typically to put us in, 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 a, in a weaker position. And, and now we've touched on kind of this administration's uh, nat national security strategy. Um, at one level, there's been a lot of continuity. Um, uh, particularly in terms of NASA continuing the Space Force, um, uh, the Vice President, you know, continuing to to basically be the, the highest ranking space focused um, uh, individual, you know, it puts it right at the top of the government executive level. So that's good to see. Very at good. At the same time, it there 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 seems to be a, a softening in terms of the view of how relevant this is to the national um, security strategy, which which is surprising. Um, I'd just like to ask you to kind of think about how all of this is going to come together, because on one side, it's clearly critical to national security, you know, and not just um, defense, but economic security. At the same time, this seems incongruous. Um, I wonder where this is going to evolve to moving forward, because the Arctic and Africa are reliant on space in many ways, and even our soft power in Africa is going to be projected to fend off the Belt and Road by helping those countries enter the space economy. So, so, so I, I wonder, do you feel that that space is is now starting to be viewed rather than as a vertical? I, I talk about this a lot in class. Space is not just a vertical like the rocket behind me, but it's also horizontal where it disrupts everything else. It, do you think that that is finally settling in people's mind and that's reflected here, or do you think um, that that this is a, a reflection? perhaps as you uh, suggested, perhaps a mistake in prioritization. Um, no, I, th I think actually that's a very helpful way you put it. I think, uh, I think this is exactly the problem is that space is seen as a vertical. I think that, you know, those of us in the space advocacy and policy community, you know, have basically, um, we've encountered a failure mode that maybe we were not expecting. So yeah. what I would say is that, you know, in the last administration, there was definitely an appreciation at the highest level of what they thought space was important for. And clearly, you know, uh, clearly Scott Pace, you know, himself was very, very empowered and, you know, was being pushed to move fast, um, you know, by those above him. You know, what I would say is that in many ways, the administration uh, has latched on to all the things where space you know, should be important, right? They're looking at domestic manufacturing, they're looking at 21st century jobs, they're yep. looking at onshoring, they're stuff. looking at climate change, um, you know, they're looking at, you know, uh, great power competition. Um, but, but, but I don't think that, I think they're very much looking at space as a vertical and not as a horizontal that really ties all those together and supports those. And I, and I think that it, it's probably because in the communities of those who are driving policy, they probably have not been adequately approached by folks in the space community who have explained to them the value proposition, you know, uh, you know, for space as grand strategy, you know, what it can do for jobs, what it can do for climate, what it can do for, you know, because it doesn't seem as if, it, as if those conversations, you know, I, I will say that we we have seen 
I thought a helpful broadening in the National Space Council to try, you know, to seed one aspect of space, which, you know, is mostly just its remote sensing across, right. you know, you know, different departments, right? But this has been more a like, let's talk about what space is already doing and, and could do, right? We're not seeing the equivalent discussion about the promise of space and what it could do for grand strategy that's reaching into economics and domestic policy and climate policy and strategy and in, in industrial based strategy, you know, we're not seeing you know things named as you know under the defense production act that are future industries you know so i it it just seems to me like if we're going to be successful with this administration you know we're going to have to be talking to energy and climate folks to you know manufacturing and in job and electrification folks uh you know that the the space vertical you know on its own you know uh seems to be you know somewhat marginalized to me um and to the extent that they're not it, it's very um it's sort of limited to you know hey we've done this great thing with dart or hey we've done this great thing with jwst the conversation isn't about where china's going and where we need to go to compete you know it, it's it you know it's almost entirely you know what can we say rah rah about and then you know how, how can we you know make existing things in space relevant you know to the space agenda and where we need to move is where all the opportunity is and where china right. is clearly attempting to compete attempting to move no thank you for that and thank you for joining us today you know we've covered a lot um it sounds in the, in that wrapping comment that you know at some level you're saying it's down to people like you and me to go out help educate the community, help real the community realize they need to be educated, because I think that's part of the challenge. Certainly, I see that in, in discussing my programs at Thunderbird in space business and leadership, both the degree and the executive program, is sometimes people are like, oh, no, but I, I already understand what's going on. It's like, well, maybe not quite. <laughs> um, there, 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 there's a little bit happening there. Um, I, I wonder if perhaps we can learn some, take some pointers from the communities around quantum and, and some of those other sciences who have become adopted as strategic. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, you know, Peter, again, thank you so much for joining us. We truly, truly appreciate having you folks. If you haven't, if you don't have it and you're in the space economy, interested in the space economy, you better get it. Um, this is really just a critical uh, piece of work. Um, and one of the things I love about it um, as a, a researcher myself is that it's super, super well-referenced. It's super well referenced. So anything they talk about here that that you want to go learn more about, they've got ten references for you to really, really deep dive, um, and it, and that makes it really powerful for a, a lot of reasons. My students are completely obsessed with this book. Um, so you know, Peter, thank you again. Um, uh, you know, and you know, just uh, you know, thank you to our sponsors at uh, America's Future Series um, and and uh, all the sponsors there. Uh, but you know, give you a last word. Um, what are you most excited about? right now you know actually what i'm most excited about is the leadership that the european space agency is taking on space solar power awesome. they are actually they have, they decided on their own after you know reading various policy documents about how everybody needs to be you know pulling to find you know net zero energy and that we're not going to make our goals uh that they needed to look into it and they sponsored these two non-space uh, industrial energy consultancy firms who surprised themselves by saying, "Hey, yeah, we actually think this will be competitive near term with other uh, with other energy." And now they are they are uh, I think they have a, a credible plan, and they're going to the ministerial level to uh, ask for like three hundred million dollars in order to retire risk for uh, an in space demo decision in twenty twenty five. So that to me you know, it has resulted in this tremendous number of articles suddenly on space solar power and the possibility that it will, um, you know, that it will sort of come back as a boomerang, you know, to the administration that wants to lead in, in climate and green energy and, and somehow has not discovered the elephant in the room, um, you know, that, uh, you know, that is a, a key element of competition with China and a key opportunity 
uh, for international leadership. So, you know, I I want to give a shout out to to ESA for you know putting something on the agenda of the of the Enlightenment civilization, you know, to to actually move forward on on something that could be so amazingly game changing. You know, the something that could scale to all global energy six times over and right. would just crack open in space assembly and manufacturing and the potential use long term use of space resources and you know a a a potential global space budget that you know the energy energy is you know I, our nasa budget is like a quarter of 1% of our budget and you know basically nothing of our gdp and we're talking about an energy market that is 9% of global GDP. So yeah, the, the, the multiplier, huge. you know, uh, and all the associated space logistics and robotics, uh, you know, ground stations, um, you know, space traffic management that would come out of that, you know, it's just would just be a stand. We would be in such a different world. It, it would be like the difference between the world before we were pumping oil and had internal combustion engines and after that that is wow. the the scale that, of change that level of, of, of change yeah so then we better get with it we better get with it all right thank you so much peter bye everyone uh really appreciate you tuning in uh, and check out the rest of the channel um some of our previous conversations as well take care